hey, let's recap 6-2 and 6-3. Um, 6-2 was um, standard normal distribution, which is not only bell-shaped, but also has mean what? What? Zero and standard deviation one, which is not very real life, but gives us a um, – way of calculating probability for distributions that aren't standard normal. Um, we just have to use the same button on the calculator and tell the calculator um, not only for which region we want the probability, but also um, the mean and the standard deviation of the population that we're dealing with. The two things that we looked for um, in last night's homework, either I gave you a left score and a right score and said find the probability that a certain value will lie between these two scores. If I said find a probability or find an area or find a percentage, which button did you use? Which one? Look at Normal, oh, I couldn't tell whose lips were moving. Yeah, normal CDF is what we use to find probability or area or a percentage of a population. Um, all three of those would be some synonymous. And then if we were given an area and we wanted to find the Z-score that has that area to the left, um, which button did we use? That's inverse norm. So that's the only two things that we talked about, the normal CDF uh, for finding probability and the inverse norm for finding Z-scores. Um, I hope that you trusted me when I said it will help you so much. If you will draw the bell-shaped curve, then you can really tell what to put on your calculator. If you shade forever to the left of a Z-score and you're looking for a probability up to that Z-score, um, what do you use for the left endpoint? on normal CDF, negative 9,999, and if you want a probability greater than a certain Z-score and you shade all the way to the right, then you still put in your left endpoint first, but then all the way to 9,999. And the only other thing I can think to ask you, um, what if I – draw a bell-shaped curve, and I give you a probability that's to the right of some z-score. Let's say the probability to the right is uh, 0.2, and I want to find the z-score that has a probability to the right of 0.2, then um, does inverse norm 0.2 give me that answer? What would I have to do? I ha always, when you use inverse norm, you have to enter the area to the right, excuse me, my hand did the right thing, my mouth said the wrong thing, to the left of the z-score that you're looking for. So if I tell you that the area to the right is 0.2, then you have to say the area to the left is 0.8, and make sure you punch inverse norm 0.8, not inverse norm 0.2. All right. Let's talk about 6.5. Um, I, I feel like if I say the same thing over and over, somehow it will magically sink in your head, and when you get to the test, you'll know which button to use for what procedure. Um, you'll understand the fine differences between the problems, because the hardest part of this test, um, any one of the problems, if you had 10 of the same kind in a row, it would be a piece of cake. You figure out which button to use on the first problem, and you use the same button on the next nine. That's not how the test is. The test has all different kinds of problems mixed together, and you have to look at it and say, is this where I use normal CDF, or is this where I use inverse norm? Not only that, today we're going to talk about not just um, the probability that, let's say, an individual man weighs more than 174 pounds, but what about the probability that the average of a group of men is more than 174 pounds? And that takes some extra, uh, one extra little trick, and other than that one extra little trick, we're going to be using the same normal CDF and inverse norm that we used last time. So 6.5, the central limit theorem. 
The central limit theorem tells us that for a population with any distribution, it doesn't even have to be a normal distribution, the distribution of sample means approaches a normal distribution as a sample size increases. What that means is if I have um, a group, well, let's stick with the group of men and their weights and the water taxi safe load and that good problem we beat to death last time. Um, even if I didn't know that the group, the weights of men were from a population that was normally distributed, even if that wasn't true, if I took groups of a hundred men and found their average weight, then and then plotted the average weight for lots of different groups of a hundred even if the men themselves didn't have weights that were normally distributed their averages of groups of a hundred would be normally distributed there's a picture coming up in just a minute um, the procedure in this section formed the foundation for estimating population parameters and hypothesis testing hypothesis testing is what we start in chapter seven all right here's the central limit theorem number one Given that the random variable X has a distribution which may or may not be normal, doesn't have to be normal, but it has some mean mu and some standard deviation sigma, we're going to choose simple random samples all of some size n from the population. Uh, going back to the water taxi problem, we might be choosing groups of 100 and finding the average for each group. The samples are selected so that all possible samples of the same size n have the same chance of being selected. That was our definition of a simple random sample. Remember, a random sample, every person in the group just had to have um, the same chance of being selected, but a simple random sample, all groups of size 5 or all groups of size 100 or all groups of any given size have the same chance of being selected. So two things. We have a random variable X, and we're going to choose simple random samples of size N. Then the distribution of the sample mean will, as the sample size increases, approach a normal distribution. Let me just hang on to that idea until we see the picture on the next page, and then I can make number one make more sense. The mean of the sample means is the population mean, and the standard deviation of the sample means is not just sigma, but here's the... Here's the important difference in what we're doing today. Instead of using sigma for the standard deviation, we have to use sigma divided by the square root of n. n is our sample size. Now, let me try to clarify one more time, and then we'll go to that picture on the next slide. If I take groups of 100 men and find their average weight and plot it on a chart or let's say um, you remember dot plots you could tell by a dot plot whether or not it was from a normal distribution because um, you had the highest frequency in the middle and then it tapered off relatively symmetric on both sides if you were plotting the average of a group average weight of a group of a hundred men and you did that over and over for lots of groups of a hundred men even if the men's weights themselves weren't normally distributed they're av the average of each group and when I say average I'm not being scientifically precise the mean of the groups sample groups would be normally distributed even if the individual weights weren't normally distributed all right in order for this slide to make sense I had to give it a setting I had to come up with a scenario that could have possibly generated these three dot plots maybe this is um, judging a university by um, faculty evaluations when you're choosing a four-year college to go to one of the things you might look at 
is the instructor evaluations of their faculty. So um, if I was going to judge 16 universities, try to rank them by the goodness of their professors, then I might choose one faculty member from each of the 16 universities. Is it good to judge a university by one of its faculty members? Not really. Um, if I just plotted, if I'm choosing one faculty member from 16 universities and I plotted um, their scores, they're ranked on a scale of one to six. If I plotted their scores, then that may or may not be a normal distribution. It looks like for this dot plot, yeah, it was, it was normal. Um, the high, the highest frequency rating was between three or four. Um, but if instead of choosing one faculty member from each of 16 universities, what if I choose 10 faculty members from each of 16 universities? That would be a much better judge of the university instead of just picking one faculty member and judging the whole school by that one faculty member's rating. Maybe I'll find the average of 10 faculty members, and that would be a better assessment. Or this last one is, what if I used 50 faculty from each university? Then that would even give me a better idea of how good the faculty at that university was, were. <laughs> Trying to be precise both grammatically and uh, statistically here. Um, the larger your sample size, the closer the sample average or sample means get to making a, distri a um, normal distribution. So even from a population that's not normally distributed, if you take groups of size n, their means will be normally distributed. And the larger your sample size is, the more normal the standard distribution will be. All right, practical rules commonly used for sample sizes in of samples of size in larger than 30. The distribution of the sample means can be approximated reasonably well by a normal normal distribution. The approximation gets closer to a normal distribution as the sample size n becomes larger. We've picked up some cutoff scores. For example, um, when considering whether a z-score is usual or unusual, what do I use for cutoff scores? What would be considered um, usual z-values? Between negative two and positive two. That's just a number that should be in your head now. If the z-score is between negative two and positive two, then you have a value that would be considered not unusual. Seems like there are some other. Oh, um, another number that should just be in your head right now. Um, something is considered unusual if its probability is less than what? 0.05, less than 5%, or if the probability is less than 0.05. So those are just numbers you have in your head as demarking something. This 30 needs to get in your head. For sample sizes larger than 30, um, you can play like it's a normal distribution no matter what distribution it's actually from, because if you have large enough samples, then the sample means will be normally distributed, even if the individual values aren't normally distributed. So one thing you're going to look at uh, in the problems in tonight's homework, you're just going to say, is the sample size larger than 30? If the sample size is larger than 30, we'll do one thing. If it's not larger than 30, we might have to do something else. Or if the original population is normally dis 
distributed, it doesn't matter what the sample size is. If you know your population is normally distributed, then the sample means are going to be normally distributed no matter what sample size you use. Um, so if I have a population, if I'm going to choose a sample size of 10, the first thing I'm going to think is, well, that's less than 30. So I can't use the procedure we're fixing to talk about unless I know the population is normally distributed. If I know the population is normally distributed, then it doesn't matter what sample size I use. I can still use the procedure that we're about to talk about. The mean of the sample mean. Think about the difference between these two symbols, plain old mu and mu sub x bar. What does that x bar stand for? Wake up. I only have two people talking to me. What is x bar? The sample mean. All right. Remember, the population mean is mu and the sample mean is x bar. So if I added up. Let's just talk about weights. If I added up the weights of all men in the population and divided by the number of men in the population, I would be getting plain old mu, the population mean. But instead of that, I can't add up all the weights of every man, in the, man in the, on the planet. But I could take groups of 100 and find the average of each group then I wouldn't be finding mu, I would be finding the mean of the sample means. And that's denoted mu sub x bar. That's the mean of the sample mean, the average of the averages. The standard deviation of the sample mean, again, the note for that is not just plain old sigma, but sigma sub x bar. Standard deviation of the sample means isn't just the population standard deviation, but it's the population standard deviation divided by the sample size. Now, here's what I know to be the truth. I know that when I stand up here speaking statistics, I sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. That's what you're hearing, right? That's okay. When we get to the examples, the examples make it a little more clear. But after we do those examples in class, and Darla just said it a minute ago, it always seems easy in class. But to really understand, you need to go back and read these slides after we've done some examples. Oh, that's what that meant. I'm going to go over all the words with you before we do the examples, but they're not going to make sense until you do some examples, and then you look back, and then you should be able to understand what that was really about. Mean of the sample means and standard deviation of the sample means. When finding the probability of an outcome for an individual, we're looking for a probability, so we're going to use normal CDF. All I have to type in is some left score, right score, comma, um, mean, comma, standard deviation. That's what we did last night. And we didn't adjust the standard deviation. If you told me the standard deviation was 15, that was the last number I put in normal CDF. That's when you're looking for the probability of an outcome for an individual. However, when you're looking for the probability for an outcome of not just an individual, but of a sample mean, the, the probability for the outcome of a group rather than an individual, that last number that you type into normal CDF is not just going to be the population standard deviation. It's going to be the population standard deviation divided by the sample size. Plain old sigma is the standard deviation for the population. Sigma sub x bar is the standard deviation for the mean of a sample. Yay, finally, do a problem. 
actually, I think we'll finish early today and we'll go across to the um, testing center 103, whatever it is, and do some homework because that's when it really makes sense. I think we'll have time to do that here in a jiffy. Mm, I thought the first problem was water taxi. Maybe I typed this problem. Okay. Um, use the same water taxi problem that we talked about last class. Assume that the population of weights of men is normally distributed with a mean of 172 pounds and a standard deviation of 29 pounds. The A part of this problem is the exact same thing you were doing last night. Find the probability that if an individual man is randomly selected, his weight is greater than 175 pounds. First thing you're going to do on every problem, did I do it on this next slide? Yes. Um, whoops. <clears throat> You're going to draw um, a bell-shaped curve. You're going to put the mean, which was given to you as 172, right in the middle of that. You're going to say 175 would be to the right of the mean. And since you want the probability that his weight is greater than 175, the shading doesn't show up on here, but you would shade to the right of 175. Maybe on the slide that you have, you can go ahead and shade in to the right of 175. And then when using normal CDF, you're going to say, I'm looking for a probability or the area that starts at 175 and goes forever to the right. We're going to use 9,999 for that. Given that... The mean is 172, and the standard deviation is 29. Put all four of those arguments in, hit enter, and you get about 46% or a probability of about 0.4588. Nothing different about that problem. That's the exact same thing we did last night. The probability that an individual would weigh more than 175 is about 46%. The probability that an individual would weigh less than 175 is about 54%. Here is the different part of the problem, though. The B part doesn't say find the probability that an individual man would weigh a more than 175. It says find the probability that a group of 20 men would have a mean weight greater than 175. I'm just going to go out into the world, round up groups of 20 men, find the average of the group or the mean of the group. What's the probability that that mean will be greater than 175? I still use normal CDF. Greater than 175 would be 175 to 9,999. I still say the um, mean weight of men is 172, but I don't have the same standard deviation right there. The standard deviation in the previous slide was given to me as, what was it, 29? Yeah, 29. I don't have 29 right here because I'm not talking about the mean for an individual. I'm talking about the mean for a group of 20. And what the central limit theorem told me was that's when I have to adjust the standard deviation by dividing it by the square root of the sample size. So instead of having 29 right here, I have 29 divided by the square root of 20 because the sample size was 20. That's about 6.5-ish when we 
do a problem that I can actually write on in just a second. I'll show you that you can actually type in 29 divided by the square root of 20 right there and not have to retype that um, digit. See you, Miss Tony. That's okay. That's all right. Um, not have to retype all those decimal places. Which I think is what we're ready to do. Nope. Two more things. Finishing up that example then, um, the probability that an individual weighed more than 175 pounds was about 46%. But in the B part, the probability that a group of 20 men would have a mean weight greater than 175 pounds was only about 32%. Here's the moral of this story. It's easier for an individual to deviate from the mean than it is for a big group to deviate from the mean. If we just took one professor from each university and we happened to pick a professor that had really, really low um, student evaluations, then we might think that whole university is bad because it's easy for one person to differ, differ greatly from the mean. But instead of choosing one professor from each university, if we chose groups of 50 from each university, it would be a lot harder for the um, average of those groups of 50 to misrepresent the university than it would be if we just took one person to represent the university. It's easier for an individual to deviate for the mean than it is for groups of 20 or groups of 50 or groups of 1,000. The larger your sample size, the closer the average or the means will be to estimating the true mean of the population. All right, I think that's what the next slide says. Given that the safe capacity of the water taxi is 3,500 pounds, there's a full, fairly good chance with a probability of about 32% that it will be overloaded with 20 randomly selected men. Remember, um, the safe load of the water taxi was calculated 44 years before the sinking occurred, and the assumption was that the average man weighed 172 pounds. Well, if you let 20 people on, 20 guys on the boat at a time, there's about a 32% chance, or about one out of three times, the taxi would be overloaded because the probability that the group's average was more than the safe load is 0.3228. I wouldn't be good. One out of three times the boat's going to sink. That's not good at all. All right. Now we can do some examples on our own. And the homework will be um, assignment 16. So let's look at these other examples I have typed up. The first one is about SAT scores. If you're going to judge a high school by its SAT scores and you just choose one student, that one student may or may not be very representative of the actual quality of the school. You might have gotten the brilliant student and everybody else is not that bright. Or you might have gotten the not so bright student when everybody else is very gifted. So this is two different situations. Um, the A part is if a one SAT score is randomly selected, what's the probability that that one is between 1440 and 1480? And the B part is, what if instead of using one student to represent the school, I use 16 students to represent the school? 
then that would probably be a more accurate reflection of the scores of the student, the entire student population than just using one score would be. So assume SAT scores are normally distributed with a mean of 1,518 and a standard deviation of 325. If one score is randomly selected, find the probability that it's between 1440 and 1480. We can use the same picture for both of these. Here's the normally distributed um, SAT scores that have a mean of 1,518. And both of the scores that we're interested in are below the mean, 1440 and 1480. We're looking for the probability in the A part that an individual score lies in that range. And in the B part, the probability that the mean of a group of 16 falls in that range. For both of them, I'm going to use, since I'm looking for a probability, I'm going to use binomial, not binomial, normal CDF. It's not binomial because there's not only two outcomes for out, um, what's your SAT score. I'm going to use normal CDF. And What's the first thing I need to enter? I'm looking for the probability that an individual score lies between what? 1440 and 1480. If I close my parentheses right now, the calculator will assume that the mean SAT score is zero and the standard deviation is one. That's not true at all. So I have to follow up with what the mean SAT score is and the standard deviation. I got that to be about 0.0483. Anybody second that? Mm -hmm. In other words, there's about a 5% chance that a randomly selected individual would have an SAT score between 1440 and 1480. Let's find the probability, not just for an individual, but in the B part, the probability that a group of 16 would have an average or a mean between 1440 and 1480. Here's what you have to watch out for the, on the test. Does the problem say individual or group? If it says group, then you have to train your brain to think, Oh, that's when I need to adjust the standard deviation. I'm not just going to use 325, but I'm going to use 325 divided by the square root of the sample size, which is in this case 16. You can either calculate, that's supposed to be sigma, it kind of looks weird. You can calculate the standard deviation of the sample means by taking the population standard deviation and dividing it by the square root of the sample size. I got that to be 81.25. And since that doesn't have too many decimal places, it would be easy to top in the same thing I did in number eight. But instead of using 325 for the standard deviation, use 81.25. That's one way I could do it. Or I could let the calculator, 
I have to double check this, but I think it works. Um, I could let the calculator find the standard deviation of the sample means right in the body of this argument. Somebody punch that. I believe it comes out to be 0.1515. So you can either calculate this and then retype it, or you can just let the calculator do the calculation inside the parentheses. Works either way. A uh, square root is second and then your square button. No, the square root first. This calculator, everything is wonderful left to right. So square root and then 16 and then close parentheses and then equals. I think it's even okay if you forget to close the parentheses. Is anybody having any trouble getting that? Did it work for you? Okay. Anybody having any trouble or you've got one of the calculators that looks slightly different? What is the one word that you're looking for on the test that's going to tell you, oh, I have to adjust the standard deviation? Group. It's that easy. If you realize group means I have to adjust the um, standard deviation, then it's just like last night's homework. The C part says, why can the sample limit or why can the central limit theorem be used in part B even though the sample size does not exceed 30? I actually forgot to ask myself, can I use the central limit theorem? I just did. But if I had been thinking like I should have been, I would have said, hey, that sample size is less than 30. I may not be able to use the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is what told us just to adjust the uh, standard deviation and then play like it's a normal. Why could I use the central limit theorem even though that sample size was less than 30? Because I was told in the beginning if it, it's normally distributed. If I didn't know that the population was normally distributed, then what I did in the B part would be invalid unless the sample size was greater than 30. But if the sample size is greater than 30, then it doesn't matter whether your sample is normally or your population is normally distributed or not. Uh, you say not enough information or you mean not normally distributed and sample size less than 30? Yeah. Then you have to say, I don't know, central limit theorem doesn't apply. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. But um, you do need to be aware of those two conditions. Either you have to know that the population is normally distributed or you have to know that your sample size is greater than 30, and then it doesn't matter whether or not your population is normally distributed. All right, <clears throat> another one. Number 12. Back to lengths of pregnancies. The lengths of pregnancies are normally distributed with a mean of 268 days and a standard deviation of 15 days. I can draw that. The normally distributed um, bell-shaped curve for lengths of pregnancies. Here's the mean of 268 days and the standard deviation is 15 days. 
in the A part, we're only concerned with one individual pregnancy. If one pregnant woman is randomly selected, find the probability that her length of pregnancy is less than 260 days. Well, that's definitely to the left of the mean. And since I'm looking for a probability that the pregnancy is shorter than 260 days, would I shade to the left or to the right of 260? To the left, and that means I'm going to use negative 9999 for my left score. That's just eight days early, a baby being born eight days before the mean length of a pregnancy. Do you expect that probability to be relatively high or relatively low? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think it's unusual for a baby to be eight days early. You don't think twice about that. That's not too much. So I expect to get kind of a high probability here. Um, do I need to adjust the standard deviation? No, because in Part A, we're just talking about an individual. Let me tell you something, though. What if, what if I just went by the rule, always divide the standard deviation by the sample size? What if I just said always? The standard deviation's 15. In the A part, what's the sample size? One. What's 15 divided by the square root of one? It's still 15. So you could always adjust the sample size, but if you divide by 1, it's not going to change. I didn't mean adjust the sample size. I meant adjust the standard deviation. But when you divide by the square root of 1, you're going to get the same standard deviation. So help me figure out what I'm punching on the calculator here. Um, Y'all watch out for me. I often say binomial CDF when I mean normal CDF. If you hear me do that, just point at me and I'll know what I've done, but I don't mean to confuse you, I just misspeak. So you only use binomial CDF when you are dealing with a binomial distribution where there are only two possible outcomes. What do I need to have in that argument? From negative 9,999 up to 260, given that the mean length of a pregnancy is 268 and the standard deviation is 15, about two weeks. I got that to be about 0.2969. Darn close to a 30% chance. About a third of babies are born a week early, and it's no big deal. But if 25 randomly, or 25 women are randomly selected and put on a special diet just before they become pregnant, find the probability that their length of their pregnancy has a mean less than 260 days. In other words, maybe some guru has come out with a diet, oh, eat only this, this, and this um, before you get pregnant, and you'll have a lower chance of having a premature baby. Let's say somebody's trying to sell a diet plan, and that's that's the thing. You you eat this while you're trying to get pregnant, and your your chance of having a premature baby will be lower. Well, let's see if it is. If the sample size is 25, then I'm still going to enter normal CDF, negative 9999 to 260, Given that the mean is 268, 
But because we're talking about a group of 25 women, and notice the word group may not be in there, but still it's implied. You're talking about 25 women instead of one. Um, I have to adjust the standard deviation. It's not just 15. It's 15 divided by the square root of 25. Actually, you could do that in your head pretty quickly. Square root of 25 is 5, and 15 divided by 5 is 3. You could just calculate that in your head and put a 3 right there. Yes, ma'am? <laughs> nope, there are three possible things for these first two numbers. If you have a score and you've shaded forever to the left, you're going to use negative 9999 up to that score. If you have a score and you've shaded to the right, you're going to use that score first. you got to have the left one first, and then positive 9999. Or if the problem says between two scores, then you just type in the left one, comma, the right one. All right. I got that to be about point zero zero three eight. About thirty percent of individual women have pregnancies or have babies a week early. But if we look at groups of twenty five, the probability that the average length is less than two hundred and sixty is now down to less than half a percent. 0 0.0038 is 0.3% or 0.4%, less than a half a percent. So if the 25 women do have a mean of less than 260 days, does it appear that the diet has effect, an effect on the length of pregnancy? And should medical supervisors be concerned? Let's see. I have to think hard about that. It is, what's the name? Um, the range, the, um, not range rule of thumb. I can't think of the name of the theorem that says, um, if you assume one thing and the results or an outcome is highly unusual, but it happens anyway, then what you assumed was probably wrong. Like if you assume a die is fair, then the probability of it landing on one is one-sixth. But if you roll that die a hundred times and 90 of them, it lands on one, then your assumption that the die was fair is probably not right. The die was probably not fair. So in the B part, we're assuming that the diet is not going to make you have uh, a baby early or late. It doesn't affect the length of pregnancy at all. That's what we're assuming in the B part. In the C, in the, and in the B part, we found the probability um, of the pregnancy lasting less than 206 days is about 0 0.003. Is that unusual? What's our magic cutoff for probability, what we consider usual or unusual? 0 0.05, that is definitely less than 0 0.05, or it is unusual for a group of 25 pregnancies to last, uh, to have, let's see, to have a mean length of less than 260 days
That's what this probability being less than 0.05 tells us. So the C part is saying if this would be unusual if the diet had no effect on the length of pregnancy, but then it happens, a group, groups of 25 women who had been on the diet all of a sudden were having lengths of pregnancy less than 260 days, what would that tell you? And this is hard to say. You ought to try to teach it. It's rough. If you assume something and then you observe an outcome that's not likely to happen under your assumption, then that means your assumption is wrong. What was our assumption in the B part? That the diet didn't cause you to have a baby early or have a baby late. But if this is highly unlikely, and yet it did happen, that's what the C part is saying, 25 women do have a mean of less than 260 days, then our assumption is probably wrong. What does that mean? The diet does have an effect. This diet is causing women to have babies before or more than a week early. Or at least it should make us go, hmm, we better check this out some more. Um, let's see. Does it appear that the diet has an effect on the length of the pregnancy? Um, yes. How could I make this clear? Um, That's the best way to say it. Something unusual is occurring. It may or may not actually be the diet causing women to have their babies a week early, but it's definitely something that medical supervisors would want to look into. Because if the diet had no effect, then that probably wouldn't happen. If this diet were in some kind of clinical trial, we'd probably just want to do some more sampling and some more testing. All right. I think we have one more. The labeling of M&M packages. Mars says that their M&Ms have a mean weight of 0.8565 grams and a standard deviation of 0.0518 grams. The label of a package containing 465 candies stated that the net weight is 396.9 grams. Actually, on a pack of M&Ms, it'd probably say 400 grams because nobody cares about that other point or 4.1 gram. Nobody's weighing their M&Ms anyway. Um, but assume that a package had 465 M&Ms and the package said it weighed 396.9 grams. If every package has 465 candies, the mean weight of an M&M would have to be this total weight divided by the number of M&Ms in the back. Let's just make it easier. If I said there were 400 M&Ms in a bag and they weighed two grams each, those would be honker M&Ms, big M&Ms, but I'm just trying to make the math easy. If the bag weighed 400 pounds, or, or excuse me, had 400 M&Ms and each M&M weighed um, two grams, then how much would in 
How many? Let me try one more time. If we knew that the bag of M&Ms weighed 400 grams, and we knew that there were 200 M&Ms in the bag, how would we find out how much each M&M weighs? Just divide the total weight by the number of M&Ms in the bag. So that's that's what, where this point eight five three five comes from. If you take the weight the bag says divided by the number of M&Ms in the bag, you get um, the average weight of an M&M. If one M&M is randomly selected, find the probability that it weighs more than 0.8535 grams. Bino, or not binomial, normal CDF or inverse norm? Normal CDF because we're looking for a probability. So normal CDF. We're looking for the probability that an M&M weighs more than 0.8535. How much more than 0.8535? Forever to the right, an infinitely big M&M that weighed 9,999 grams. There are not going to be any M&Ms out there, so you don't have to worry about it. Given that the mean is 0.8565 and the standard deviation is 0.0518, do I need to make an adjustment on that in the A part? I could divide it by the square root of 1 if I wanted to, but that wouldn't change it. It's still 0.0518. I got that to be about 0.5231. Anybody second that? All right. Let me tell you what it means. We're assuming when we buy a pack of M&Ms that Mars is giving us exactly what they told us, that we're getting our money's worth, that the package is labeled correctly. If the pa package is labeled correctly, then there's still about a 52% chance that I would get an M&M bigger than 0.8535 or heavier than 0.8535 wouldn't be surprising. I mean, gosh, that's too nearest 10,000th of a gram. You're going to have to have a very precise scale to measure that anyway. But um, it wouldn't be surprising to get one M&M that was, actually, this is underweight. This is 0 0.0013 grams below average. So what? You get one skinny M&M. But what if we had a whole bag randomly selected and we want the probability that their mean weight is at least 0.8535 grams? Point eight five three five to 9,999, given that the mean is 0 0.8565, but I'm not going to use the same 0.0158 for the mean, because I'm not talking about an individual M&M now. I'm talking about 465 M&Ms. So I need to adjust the standard deviation by dividing it by the square root of 465.
I got 0.8944. Four one instead of four four. Oh, okay. All right. I must have just written down that number wrong last time I wrote it. In other words, in a in not just an individual M and M, but in a whole bag of M and Ms, there's about an eighty nine percent chance that the average size of the M and M is as big as it's supposed to be. But an 89% chance that it is as big as it should be means what? What's the complement of that? There's an 11% chance of getting an underweight bag of M&Ms. Now, how much that upsets you just depends on how much you care about getting your money's worth. Where M&Ms are concerned, if you are an M&M <laughs> addict, that could upset you. Um, I'm going to say 89% chance that the um, weight is labeled correctly, but there's an 11% chance. of getting an underweight bag of M&Ms. I would be less upset about an underweight bag of M&Ms than a premature baby. So how important, how significant something is just determines on, uh, is determined by the consequences of what happens next. Remember the difference between statistical significance and practical significance? With this 11% chance of um, getting an underweight bag of M&Ms make you want to sue Mars, the Mars Candy Company? Probably not. But what if some prenatal vitamin was causing 11% of pregnant women to have premature babies? That would be a lot and probably would have practical significance. It would probably be.